Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, and welcome to the final event of the 2014 Atlas Summit. We will be having a panel discussion on the state of the objectivist movement today. I think this is going to be an interesting discussion and pregnant with different ideas and perspectives or, and shared ideas and perspectives and how to deepen them. Our panel is chaired by Jay LaPere, who is the chairman of the board of the Atlas Society. But that's just a hobby for Jay, while, you know, giving us all his wisdom, his knowledge about how to run a business. It's really kind of a side project because he's president and CEO of Latrum LLC, which is a global manufacturing company based in Louisiana. It's comprised of merely four operating divisions, Intralox LLC, Latrum Machinery Incorporated, La Pair Stair, and if you should look up La Pair Stair if you have not done it because Jay's father invented a, an amazing uh, and simple idea that's, that's revolutionary, really. And uh, the Latrum Machine Shop LLC, and has, the company has over 1,700 employees worldwide. And then, besides serving on the TAS Board of Trustees, he's also the chairman of Ion Geophysical. So accomplished man, very knowledgeable about objectivism and committed to its future. Also on the panel is David Kelly. David Kelly is the founder of the Atlas Society. Uh, he declared that uh, objectivism had to be an, uh, a growing, living philosophy with room for dissent and room for innovation when he founded the organization, which was then called the Institute for Objectivist Studies. David's an accomplished professional philosopher, teacher, and best-selling author with a PhD in philosophy from Princeton University, having taught at Vassar College and Brandeis University. And his books include Unrugged Individualism, The Selfish Basis of Benevolence, The Contested Legacy of Ayn Rand, Truth and Toleration in Objectivism, and The Evidence of the Senses, a Treatise on Epistemology. And that's not mentioning The Art of Reasoning, his widely used logic textbook, which is now in a new fourth edition. Rounding out the panel, we have David Harriman. David Harriman's training is in physics and philosophy, um, and uh, he holds a master's in philosophy from Claremont Graduate University. He's notable as uh, the person in the objectivist movement who has written the most substantial treatment of induction from an objectivist perspective. That's the logical leap induction in physics. He's also notable as the editor of the journals of Ayn Rand, and I know that some people criticized his editing of those journals, and uh, you're welcome to ask him questions if you want. Uh, he has lectured and published articles on a wide range of topics, including the scientific re revolution, the concept of space, and the influence of Kantian philosophy on modern physics. He's written op-eds that are widely published, and his current project, co-founded with Tom Van Dam, is the Falling Apple Science Institute, a nonprofit that's developing a unique K-12 science curriculum based on the inductive method, and boy, is such a thing needed. So please welcome our distinguished panel, and welcome Jay LaPierre, the chair of the panel. Thank you, Will. This should be, a, should be an interesting panel, because uh, when we, we prepared for it, uh, we really didn't have a sort of a, a clear picture of, of who'd be in charge. And I know David Harriman said, well, I'm counting on, on um, uh, Jay, you, you and David to sort of just, just uh, handle this thing. And I know I was counting on the two Davids to handle it. And then I just checked in with David, and he says, I thought you were going to handle it. So we got it all straightened <laughs> out. Um, but the, it's billed as a discussion or a panel on objectivism. And I think in order to, to uh, objectivism today, the movement today, and I think what we want to do is frame a little bit of the past, the history, have um, start with David Kelly doing that, and then we'll each comment on it a little bit, and then we'll come back and particularly emphasize the difference in the two major, the open and close, that, that history, then come back and talk about the obstacles to the movement, um, and then we'll open it up for questions and have as much of this be a, a Q&A session as possible. So uh, David, with that, if you'd begin. All right. Thank you, Jack. <coughs> um, well, I expect most people here uh, know something about the history of the, the movement, um, although 
I do want to give a little bit of background um, because we have many people who have uh, joined us for the first time at this summit. Uh, in 1989 or so, um, <clears throat> I was, uh, was the beginning of a rift between me and uh, Leonard Peikoff as an individual and then it grew into um, the Ayn Rand Institute. And the <clears throat> there were a number of issues involved, but the two key ones that, uh, er, that came to the fore at the time, <clears throat> one was that I had uh, given a talk to a libertarian group, a small supper club uh, associated with laissez-faire books in New York City, um, talking about why <clears throat> um, the cause of liberty required uh, could not succeed without being founded on certain core objectivist uh, ideas. And we had a great discussion, a lively, lively debate. <clears throat> uh, subsequently, I was attacked for that in an objectivist publication for speaking to libertarians because the, uh, I guess I could call it the official attitude, the, the prevailing attitude was um, <clears throat> among people at the Ayn Rand Institute and. Uh, elsewhere in the organized movement was that libertarians were um, not people you wanted to uh, associate with for reasons we don't have to go into, but um, Ayn Rand had been um, very critical of them, uh, of non-objectivist libertarians. And <clears throat> I thought it was time to um, engage. We, you know, we shared uh, the principles of liberty and the desire to see government re restricted, subjected to the rule of law, individual rights protected, and so forth. Anyway, um, so I wrote a response to th this public attack, and, <clears throat> and a, a, a debate ensued about um, sanctioning libertarians. The other issue that um, came to the fore was the nature of objectivism as a system of ideas. <clears throat> Because in the course of, of a, my fairly brief four-page response to the uh, attack on me, I had said objectivism um, <clears throat> is not a, a closed system. We should be open to um, engaging with other people. We might even learn something. And that <clears throat> I actually just said that in passing, um, that reference to it's not a closed system. I thought uh, it was obvious. Uh, I couldn't imagine anyone disagreeing with that. Um, <clears throat> I even <coughs> sent the thing to Leonard. We were kind of uh, estranged at the time, but I sent it to him thinking, yeah, okay, <laughs> this at least we're not going to have a, a, an argument about, right? <laughs> well, I was wrong. Um, one of <coughs> many things I turned out to be wrong about. Um, <clears throat> and Leonard uh, responded by saying, yes, objectivism is a closed system. It is the system of ideas that Ayn Rand stated uh, and uh, wrote <coughs> and promulgated uh, uh, as well in, in her lectures and talks. <coughs> and that's it. It is all but only the system of philosophical ideas that she put forward. And so <coughs> I s that re really made no sense to me. And so I, <coughs> I, I wrote uh, a book. Uh, which is now called, the, in the current edition, is called the, Co the Contested Legacy of Ayn Rand, uh, which we have out on display um, <clears throat> and is available uh, online. So those two issues, libertarianism and open versus closed objectivism, were the, were the, the core issues in a split that emerged uh, when I subsequently founded the Institute for Objectivist Studies. Uh, <clears throat> we were promoting an alternative, independent um, organization for objectivists who did not want to be or had, had been alienated from the more, what I consider to be the more orthodox um, uh, objectivist approach. So <clears throat> over, the, over the past now 24 years, uh, there's been a, a quite a bit of change in the landscape uh, within the movement, we have grown and and succeeded uh, in a lot of uh, a great deep, great many of the aims that I had initially. The Ayn Rand Institute has grown and um, has also done many <coughs> succeeded in many of its projects. Uh, 
the, the most significant change is that the Ayn Rand Institute is now, <coughs> has essentially dropped any opposition to engagement with libertarians. Uh, <coughs> they have active partnerships with um, many organizations. They speak at, at libertarian organizations. And John Allison, who had been, uh, if not chairman of the board, uh, the, the one of the most, the, the prominent funder and theorist of, uh, of the Ayn Rand Institute in, in, in uh, the last 10 years anyway, is now the, the um, CEO of the Cato Institute. So uh, that is no longer an issue. Uh, as someone mentioned the other day, I'm, I'm still waiting for the letter saying thank you, David, for um, getting there first. Um, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> <laughs> uh, when, when John Allison took over as CEO of uh, Cato, I went and scheduled a meeting with him to see where things stood because there had been quite a bit of animosity previously. And uh, whereas we'd had a wonderful collaborative relationship with, with Cato previously. Uh, <clears throat> and anyway, in the course of that discussion, I, I, I made that same joke and he said, don't hold your breath for that letter. <laughs> And he was laughing. I mean, so anyway, um, but the issue of open versus closed objectivism remains um, a, a fundamental split between two ways of, of uh, thinking about objectivism as a philosophy and being an objectivist um, in practice and being an objectivist movement and organization. What we mean by uh, the way I would define the issue um, <clears throat> The idea of objectivism as a closed philosophy, and this is something that Leonard Peikoff had laid, off, laid out in uh, a follow-up article uh, critiquing me way back when. The idea is that the philosophy is complete. Unlike a science, philosophy deals with timeless issues that are not based on empirical research. So in a sense, it, although it's based on, on uh, observation of reality, it is not dependent on the state of knowledge of, of science uh, or technology or anything else. And philosophers, good philosophers, can define, can deal with all the issues, for, deal with them in an integrated way, form a system, and it's complete. And there's nothing left to do. Um, and also that when you have a system like that, it has a fixed identity. And that identity is all of the philosophical tenets that are components of it in this integrated system. And it, you change one thing and it has ripple effects throughout the whole philosophy. So you can't change anything and, and have it remain the philosophy it was. <clears throat> I think that's a fundamentally false view of philosophy. I think it is actually a body of knowledge that has much more in common with science uh, and is um, accordingly open to discovery and debate. I've never, literally, over the, I've thought about this a lot over the years. Um, I thought about it a lot in writing my book. And I, it's very hard for me to be a good teacher here and just present the issues in neutral terms <clears throat> and make the best case for both sides. Because I, I honestly don't know what a coherent case for the other side is. Um, other, uh, maybe someone else can articulate it better than I can. <clears throat> because I think the first problem is the idea of, of objectivism as a closed system of ideas um, applies only to Ayn Rand's philosophical ideas, not to her views on art or on uh, the psychology of romantic love or any of the other uh, applications of the ideas. So you, you, the first question we have to have is, <clears throat> have to consider is how do you determine what are her philosophical statements and as opposed to the non-philosophical statements that's an active interpretation and people disagree so there has to be some open discussion about that and ultimately um, everyone including knowledgeable experts who are well grounded in the philosophy inevitably will have somewhat different um, views about it and they will argue and <clears throat> we will get a finer and finer conception of it as scholars of Ayn Rand. <clears throat> Secondly, I, I truly don't understand how anyone except Ayn Rand on this view c 
could be called an objectivist because we know what her words were, but the philosophical system is not just the words, it's the structure of ideas and concepts and principles that are expressed in the, those words and might have been expressed in somewhat other ones. <coughs> no one, um, I, I, I shouldn't say no one because I'm constantly surprised, but uh, <clears throat> I don't think, I wouldn't expect anyone on, on the closed uh, <coughs> interpretation to hold that <coughs> the philosophy is just the body of words, like the Bible just is that set of words, and the Quran just is the set of words that were allegedly dictated to uh, Muhammad by Allah. <clears throat> so you, the question is, who, who could have the same philosophical content in their head as Ayn Rand? Oh, I, I could, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it, Jay. <laughs> Um, so we've got two people, Ayn Rand and Jay, and yeah. but the, I, I don't know who else would be an objectivist. Um, and finally, you know, perish the thought, but if Ayn Rand had died before, for example, she came up with the idea of self-esteem as an important uh, cardinal value, but someone else had, like maybe a psychologist who had who worked with her, um, <laughs> would, would that mean that, that that is not part of objectivism? Or if she had lived longer and r uh, dealt with other issues, like induction, uh, and written, if she had written the logical leap, would that then become in incorporated into objectivism? Whereas, because it was done by David and Leonard Peikoff, um, it is simply, it is not literally objectivism. Th th these are the kinds of things that bother me and make me think, <clears throat> I don't genuinely understand the, uh, the alternative. So, but the point about the movement here is there has been no movement on this issue internally. Um, every time I've spoken with uh, Yaron Brook, <coughs> and <coughs> I think, Jay, you've, you've had uh, more conversations, and of course, David, you, you were, um, uh, in working on the book project, were um, um, it, more in touch with, with the folks at ARI than probably any of us. So. Uh, but every time that I or Jay, at any rate, have uh, talked, there, there is still the same issue. We still go around in the same kinds of arguments. <coughs> so that's where we stand, and I will, I'm, I'm inclined to leave it there, but I just want to make one more point. <clears throat> I think there's more in this particular issue and conflict than the philosophical arguments about the philosophy. Because before it all blew up, <clears throat> when I was working with Leonard, who was actually a great mentor to me, um, when I <clears throat> was writing my, uh, my first book, The Evidence of the Senses, we had long discussions. I, I, for example, there was one little issue in epistemology of perception that I thought Ayn Rand was wrong about, about sensations and perceptions. And I wrote that in a chapter. I didn't write it that she was wrong. It was a technical academic book. But um, so Leonard and I talked about it. And he said, I don't know. I think I, I see what you're getting at. But in any, in any case, then, so the book came out. I, I had said something contrary to a, a fairly specific, relatively minor point um, in Ayn Rand's writings. And no one made anything of it. You know, we just had, OK. So it seemed like an advance. Uh, or if you di disagreed with me, it wasn't, my view was not an advance, but it didn't mean that um, anyone thought I was no longer an objectivist for that. So I think it was only <clears throat> after uh, <clears throat> I didn't join in the general denunciation of Barbara Brand Brandon's book, um, Leonard and I had a falling out. There were issues, I think, um, at least below the surface of loyalty and disloyalty um, to individuals and groups um, that turned what in, retros in retrospect um, seemed like, or what at the time seemed like a throwaway line. <coughs> Objectivism is not a closed philosophy. Oh, yeah. Um, <coughs> has turned into this debate that has gone on and on for 25 years now um, on the internet and 
still is a major dividing issue. However, uh, I will also add that I think um, there, ha there is a greater, somewhat greater measure of civility <coughs> in the broader movement, um, particularly because of the engagement of, of the Ayn Rand Institute with libertarian organizations. We, we cross paths a lot, and uh, <coughs> we don't snarl in public. <laughs> okay, let me uh, add my perspective on that. Um, I think this issue of open objectivism versus closed objectivism is a bit elusive, and I, I want to ex try to explain why. The, there are nice, clean issues where two groups disagree, but they completely agree on what the issue is, on the definition of the issue. Um, they simply disagree on what the right answer is. Um, you find a lot of those issues in science, and I, I like those nice, clean issues. Um, I don't think that this one falls into that category. And here, here's why. If, um, if you ask someone who describes themselves as a closed objectivist what they mean, well, on the surface, they say something perfectly reasonable. They say, well, Ayn Rand created a philosophic system. Um, she passed away. Uh, she's not going to add to it. She's not going to modify it. Um, it is what it is. And, and they say now <clears throat> that the other side, the open objectivists, are they want the freedom to disagree with essentials, fundamentals of her philosophy and, and still misleadingly call themselves objectivists. Um, and, and so that's what this debate is about. Well, that's not what the debate is about because, I mean, that's a perfectly reasonable position. Ayn Rand did what she did and then passed away. Um, and, um, and people shouldn't be Kantians and call themselves objectivists because that's misleading. Um, but nobody's going to disagree with that. Okay, so if that's what the battle is about, you're, you're shadow boxing. You're, you're fighting a battle without an opponent. Um, so <clears throat> that, um, that is not what this is about, but that's the way they frame it. Now, on the other side, look at it from the open objectivist perspective. Um, if you frame the issue that, well, what, what the open objectivism means is simply that um, each individual has to um, be free to raise questions about this body of work and come to their own understanding of it and their own application of it and, um, and that they shouldn't be, uh, and the other side is just dogmatic and authoritarian and just in favor of reciting the words of the master. Well, I mean, if, if that's the issue, then again, um, the ARI side would say, no, that's not what they're in favor of. They wouldn't sign up to that interpretation of their position. Okay. So the <clears throat> that's why I call this a little bit elusive, because you have to decide what the disagreement really is here. Um, now, I think there is a bit of truth um, to the fact that certain questioning has been frowned upon um, by the ARI um, side and that a disagreement over a minor point gets blown up into, well, if you disagree with a minor aspect of her aesthetics, um, implicitly that means you reject the primacy of existence. Uh, <laughs> and obviously if you take that to an extreme, um, that, that does lead to this uh, authoritarian attitude and uh, students being a bit uh, reluctant to even raise their questions, um, which is definitely an unhealthy thing. Um, I'll say on the flip side that uh, um, 
if I, when I meet somebody, and I have met such people, who I think really do fundamentally disagree with essential aspects of Rand's philosophy and insist on calling themselves objectivists, I do have a problem with that. Um, I, first of all, I don't even understand the motive for it. I mean, if you believe, I mean, believe whatever you want, but why do you want to call it objectivism? Why do you want to piggyback on Ayn Rand's achievement if, in fact, you're disagreeing with her on fundamentals. Um, so, but, again, it's, uh, I agree with uh, what David said that, see, when you try to pin down the explicit issue, both sides deny that they hold the wrong position that they're accused of holding. <laughs> okay, so then you're left with, what, what is the issue? And as far as I can tell, it's more one of attitude. Do you feel constrained by writings and texts in your, in your thinking, in your thought? Uh, are, you, are you afraid of um, a uh, disapproval or being booted out of the in-group? Um, and I think there is a bit of that um, at, uh, in the ARI circle. And so, I mean, I, I would say that, uh, that everyone, obviously, has to come to their own understanding of these ideas. And what's really important is coming to the deepest understanding you can, um, applying them in your life and your work um, to the best of your ability. Uh, and to that extent, everybody should be on board with the same mission. Uh, so... <laughs> let me uh, let me pick up on on two points that have been been made. First, I'll I'll talk about how I uh, came to what I'll call David's view, and that was a, a bit of a long a long process. But I was attending ARI things. I, I was reading their materials. I, um, I was attending their events, reading materials, listening to lectures. And when David was uh, separated, I don't think they like other language, but, but separated from, um, from uh, uh, ARI, the, uh, I read um, or I, I heard Peikoff's explanation of it. I thought, yep, he's absolutely right, and that was the end of it. And then someone um, said, you know, I'm not sure that really was that, right? And the process was not really quite as open as we would have expected and they expressed a little bit of reservation so I, I somehow uh, got a hold of, of David's uh, book Truth and Toleration I think was the title at, at the time read that and I thought ooh uh, that seems right and um, <laughs> so uh, not having that? not oh. having the IQ points that uh, that either of these guys had I I thought well there is a, a simple part of this that I, I believe in deeply and that is that the debate that David just framed, the, the inability to actually say what is the true debate, that, that's the heart of the problem and, that the, and the only way to get there is to have an organization and this is what the Atlas Society's mission is, is to, to be founded uh, with the idea that we believe in independent judgment, um, or, or rational uh, discussion, uh, open uh, discussion and debate in search of truth and that's the whole point of it so on that alone that gave me comfort that well I'm I'm very confident about from a process point of view we shouldn't be declaring issues off the table when they're when it's not reasonably obvious that there's no substance to it when people have questions legitimately you should be having an open discussion on those and and that's how I got there so that is what we've done and I would say one other thing that I think is material in this, and that seems to be the, the conflating of the ideas with the person um, that bothered me a great deal. And, and I uh, sort of gravitated to the idea that if, if, if Rand was the personification of her ideas and we can't find any flaws uh, in her, and then uh, the, her actual behavior of uh, having uh, the, the affair, and then to me, which, which I think is really uh, a terrible, is allowing 
uh, Leonard Peikoff, who clearly is a brilliant man. I learned a tremendous amount from, from uh, uh, Leonard's lectures and reading his material to believe deeply that there's no possibility that she could have had that affair and be her, you know, sworn defending her as that, that, that just struck me as, well, that's not the personification of the heroic ideas. That does not diminish in any way my view of Rand and her achievements and the greatness of her, just that she's a human being and she had, she had some, some flaws and, uh, and, and, and I just don't think that that's particularly debatable, so. Thank you. I want to um, just add a couple of things. I, I think what David said about the debate is absolutely dead right. Uh, and I, I have struggled and tried as best I can to frame it. Um, but I know, even as I do so, that I am probably stating principles that uh, it, uh, I'm probably explaining the closed view in a way that no one who says they hold it would agree with. <laughs> um, <clears throat> however, I, I was trying to extract the essence of, of what Leonard Peikoff has said, so I, di I didn't make it all up. <clears throat> but <clears throat> I, I want to I add two more points and then maybe we can open for discussion. <clears throat> one is that, that David's formulation of the, the view from the Ayn Rand Institute side of what we stand for as, you know, every, anyone can ch change anything in the philosophy, reject, replace it with, um, with their own um, theories, and still call themselves objectivists is uh, something I, I would also say is not acceptable. It, but, in, but I think, uh, and I spent time in the book trying to define what objectivism is in terms of its essentials. And if you hold those essentials, then I think you are in the category of being an objectivist. And, but if you re there's certain ones that, um, like the primacy of existence, uh, <clears throat> egoism, capitalism, I mean, I, I lay it out, I go through the whole philosophy and say, Here's, here, here, are, here are the really core principles that are the skeleton of the system. <clears throat> and um, we can, you know, the, f the flesh can change, but the skeleton um, has to remain or it's no longer objectivism. It, it does have an identity. It's just so it's partly an issue about what is the identity of a body of ideas or a system of ideas that has been labeled with a philosophical name like objectivism. Um, <clears throat> and uh, along those lines, I too am uh, extremely impatient to say nothing worse, uh, about some of the uh, people who have taken our position and our, our call for an open movement as um, saying anything goes. It doesn't. Uh, and along those lines, I have to say, the whole idea of object open objectivism is uh, linked with a view of tolerance and toleration. Uh, that was a, another part of the issue. Um, but people <coughs> have often assumed, and this is not just the interpretation of people who don't like uh, the Atlas Society or me or open objectivism, but it's a view held or implicitly seems to be uh, held by <coughs> some people who welcomed our initiative that um, toleration means we're, we're eager to hear anything and we're open to any change, any ideas under the umbrella of objectivism. Uh, we're not. We, uh, w we have and try to maintain and apply rigorous intellectual standards. <clears throat> I, after, after the, I uh, founded the organization, which was, uh, it was in Poughkeepsie at the time, Poughkeepsie, New York, on the Hudson River. And <clears throat> I was kind of surprised because I've been used to dealing um, under the, uh, <laughs> within the regime and, and culture of, of the Ayn Rand Institute. Uh, that people were pretty knowledgeable. They studied, they, they, they learned their objectivism. And I was suddenly getting all kinds of stuff from people who had all manner of ideas. I mean, I, 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 start, I actually um, um, started a file just called Nuts. <coughs> <laughs> Letter, letters I didn't answer or whatever. Uh, <coughs> you know, they, they, there was a, uh, a statement some, some ways back, I forget uh, exactly when, but 
uh, about California, uh, a remark about California during, I guess, the um, um, <coughs> Lucy Goosey uh, uh, period, periods there. Maybe there's still Lucy Goosey out there. But the, the joke was, uh, at, some, at some point, the country tilted and everything loose rolled, rolled west. Um, I, ha I had the sense that uh, after I started my organization, the country tilted and, and everything, everything loose began rolling toward Poughkeepsie. Um, <laughs> I would say that we have, in fact, tried to maintain not lower standards but even higher ones because loyalty doesn't count with us. If you have um, an argument, you better be able to defend it, and it doesn't matter if I happen to agree with it or not. Um, there are even if I'm not sharp enough to pick holes in, in your argument for a position I hold with, I've got lots of other people, smart people around who will, who will do, do that job. We do, uh, loyalty doesn't count with us, only w truth and, and logical rigor. That at least is our goal. Um, I don't know how, I think we're batting, we got a pretty good batting average on it. So um, with that said. With, with that said, we'll move, well, I don't think we can quite move to questions. I want to do a, a, a one more <clears throat> question, David, and we'll, we'll start with you. What, what do you see as the challenges to the movement and to progress in the movement? Okay, I, I have my own perspective on this. Um, I mean, I know a lot of the people in the movement are, are doing great work um, pushing uh, uh, free market economics and individual rights, and I, I Love all of that, but the one, from my perspective, I'm an epistemologist, and uh, I work in philosophy of science and in um, in education. And in terms of long-term fundamental change in a culture, I I think the way that you make progress is through epistemology. A Ayn Rand once said, "Philosophy is primarily epistemology," and I think. You can add to that the way a philosophy influences a culture deeply in the long run is through its epistemology. Um, uh, that's actually why I'm working in the field I'm working right now, um, trying to reform education in a way that kids during their formative years get a type of education that, where, that they emerge from actually knowing how to think and they can deal with any issue that comes their way, including political issues. I mean, one, of the, one of the frustrating things about, uh, that all of us have seen in terms of political discussions and debates, and you can watch them on TV uh, every day, I suggest you don't, but <laughs> the, um, is you look at the two sides and you say, this isn't even an argument. Uh, these people have no idea what logic is. I mean, they don't know how to think. And that's why they're just going around and around um, with this nonsense. Uh, so I think in the long run, that's what we need to change. That's where the fight is. I'll, I'll add, I think, uh, quickly, I think the self-inflicted problems of the movement that we've talked about, the idea that we're not big tent oriented enough, that we don't look to engage this open dialogue has been a, has been a problem. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that, um, that epistemology is as big an issue, though, from the world that I deal in, which is probably more of a layman's world. Where I see the, the bigger problems is, is in ethics, where, where egoism is, uh, is simply not uh, accepted. The profit motive is somehow evil, and, that, and that's a, a really big deal uh, that I think until we accept that we, we have the right to flourish and to, to build the best lives and to... Uh, trade without, uh, I think that's an ethical uh, dilemma because I think we've won a lot of the economic arguments, but without the moral arguments, you still, I think secular egalitarianism is still a religion, and I think that's a, a huge problem. So, thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll open it for questions, so I expect there'll be many. Please come up to the mic. Thank you. So um, I, I guess despite knowing Rand for a long time, was introduced to this conversation fairly recently. I wanted to try out an analogy for you that I think helps explain it in a way that at least made it make sense to me as to what I mean by open versus closed. And that is Euclidean geometry. Euclidean geometry has three fundamental premises. 
It didn't die when Euclid died. In fact, there's still advances going on in Euclidean geometry today, not in the academic world. Uh, if it had died when Eu Euclid had died, it wouldn't be a very meaningful piece of mathematics. On the other hand, if, you're outside, if you don't start or you're not consistent with one of those three fundamentals, you're either wrong or you're not doing Euclidean geometry. I'll go with that. Yeah. Thanks uh, to all three of you. Um, it was great to hear this uh, discussion. Uh, I've been troubled for a little while with the, with the term open objectivism because it, it, I think it sometimes sounds like modified objectivism. Um, and just the fact that you're ad we're adding a word to it. Um, and I do think that sometimes that misinterpretation does get, is, is made in other circles, sometimes in libertarian circles. There's the idea that the Ayn Rand Institute really tries to keep to objectivism, whereas the Atlas Society is, is, is promoting an open version of it. But that, that it, and I think that's a problem because people then tend to internalize the idea that, that objectivism has to be modified in some way in order to be tolerant. Um, and I, and I, I, wonder, I wonder if you guys can comment on the term. It would, I would just so much, I, I realize there has to be a way of distinguishing views, but it, this seems that, that modifying the word rather than just saying we're promoting objectivism. Right, well, you, uh, I'll be happy to comment problem. because this was, this was very much a, uh, a board and board strategy uh, with, with, I would say, the deeper thinkers uh, not, not uh, thinking or appreciating the, and being as enthusiastic about the wisdom of this, uh, of this move. What we felt was that uh, from discussions with, uh, with ARI that the objection was that we're hijacking Rand's term and uh, that by putting a qualifier in front of it, we could at least then differentiate that we're not trying to hijack the term. So to the extent there was a moral argument that we were stepping into that space the way David just described, this, this would eliminate that problem and allow us to figure out a way to, quote, get along and, uh, and, and have a more cooperative effort to advance and also distinguish if they wanted to say objectivism meant literally Rand's writings as defined by, you know, Peikoff, well, at least we could then say an open objectivism. And we felt that would probably disappear at, at some point if, if, uh, if, uh, if the philosophy progressed, but that was our thinking. Jared, I, I'd like, just like to add one point. Uh, at, at least in our minds, um, Ray, <clears throat> open does not mean any, does not apply to the content of the philosophy. We are objectivists, period. We, what we do is we, we view objectivism as an open system. We do so on grounds, epistemological grounds, that are rooted in objectivism, and we practice it in a way um, in encouraging discussion and debate. That's what the openness means. And that may, that may be just too subtle a distinction um, for, for public use. Um, and I, we do recognize that risk. Um, but that is, that is certainly what we mean internally. And I, it's our practice not to say that what we teach is open objectivism. When David and I are doing Atlas University videos, we don't say, now this next point in open objectivism <laughs> is whatever. But when I opened this conference, I said, this is the conference of open objectivism because it's a conference characterized by this attitude that the philosophy is open and people who are committed to the terms of open discussion that that entails. So there, we don't use it to mean the philosophy as such. We mean it to be uh, practicing the philosophy in a certain key. I, I, I do want to just clarify my point. I, I did not say, I did not, do not think that, that by calling that this movement changes objectivism in any way that this, this movement is advocating objectivism as is correctly understood. <laughs> um, but I, I think just as a rhetorical device. Sure, yeah, I understand. Yeah, just uh, two points. First of all, uh, when David Kelly and I and uh, John Ugly Laura went down to North Carolina to meet with Allison and Yarn Brook, I think it was the first time you had met Yarn, uh, uh, David. Um, one of the things that David brought up in that meeting was, well, 
if we were doing this, if we were doing objectivism the way normal academics and people of ideas do it, we would be having panels like the panel we're having right here. Why haven't we had one yet, Yaren? And uh, so I'm happy to see that we are having a panel like that. In other words, Yaren would be on one side and we'd be on the other. We'd have a nice talk about it. So anyway, it's good that we're doing that. But my more specific question, uh, I, I take your, your, your point about uh, you know, how we define the, the, the issues, and each side would say, no, that's not what we are. Uh, in, uh, in, in the debate with David, uh, Leonard Peikoff said, I think, uh, something to the effect of, when someone puts forward an idea or proposition, you compare it to the ideas of Ayn Rand the way you would com prepare, com compare a proposed law to the Constitution, and then say it's good or bad. The implication, and this is where it gets practical, is uh, to what extent in ARI do you come, do, and I haven't been to OCONS, I've, you know, I was involved with PCOF and so forth before the break, do you have open discussions and consideration of new ideas in the sense that at these meetings for the, certainly the last number of years, many of us have looked at the works of Steven Pinker, Jonathan Haidt, people like that about how the mind works, how the brain works, to say if these are real facts about how human beings are, we have to take this into consideration when we develop systems of education, training, what is rational. These are very important things, and so we're having these discussions, and it's vibrant, and it's wonderful and great, and I'm wondering to what extent in practice there have been maybe problems in ARI, and I, can't, I don't know, that's why I'm asking you, where would people have those kind of discussions uh, and those kind of inquiries? Okay. Um, well. First of all, I should explain uh, what my position was <clears throat> at ARI. They, they gave me writing grants to work in philosophy of science. Uh, mm -hmm. I was never actually even an employee of ARI, much less mm -hmm. in a position to have input on management and policy and personnel decisions. So. Um, Mm -hmm. I did not work as closely with the whole circle as uh, uh, I think some people have, have imagined. Mm -hmm. I worked very closely. I had a 15-year, I think, productive working relationship with Leonard Peikoff. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the other thing that's a little peculiar about my situation was I was working on the one philosophic issue that mm -hmm. Ayn Rand admitted mm -hmm. um, that she hadn't offered anything on, really. She had not um, dealt with the problem of how we acquire and validate inductive generalizations, which mm -hmm. was my field. Yeah, I asked her in 1979 that question at an event, and she said, the one thing I would like to do is more work on induction. <laughs> well, I mean, she, yeah. she allowed as to how this was a, uh, a crucial philosophic issue. And, and she even characterized it by saying it's the, it's the only um, crucial uh, philosophic issue that she had not developed um, views on. So, I mean, in a, in a sense, I'm working in the one field that... Uh, was open. <laughs> was wide open. Um, and, and, and certainly there were... Uh, um, uh, wide open discussions about that. I mean, I, I spent years talking um, to Dr. Peikoff uh, about those issues. Uh, so um, I, didn't, I didn't feel restricted um, in any sense, and I wasn't at ARI to see what, uh, you know, what kind of things were, were going on with the students there. Hi. Um, I've actually, I'm, I'm late to the objectivism game, um, and, you know, in reality, I'm not an objectivist. If objectivist is a Boolean yes or no, I want the whole package. But that's okay from my perspective, because I'm here and I'm learning and doing interesting things, and I'm observing. If I were to look at the way the Simpsons describe objectivism, it's the randroids. It's vocabulary we actually had at Porkfest in a discussion and arguments over whether or not you have to be the rigid soldier of Rand. The problem is that you can't get there 
in one giant leap without some transition, education, and adaption. The public says, uh, there's an article online from someone who is a Jewish, whatever they call their people, I don't remember, a guy who runs a Jewish church rabbi, who says objectivism is consistent with being Jewish, they just haven't proved it yet. <laughs> okay, they haven't proved the existence of God, but when they do, obviously, then everyone will know that you need to be Jewish. Question? Yes, getting there. And so what is the goal of embracing enough people to make the objectivist philosophy encompass a worldwide awareness and change. If you're not including enough people and training them to ask the right questions so they come to the right end. Because if you're not inclusive and get people to see the world from your perspective and ask them to be Boolean, don't you see how that pushes more people away than bring them together? Do you want, do you, do you want me? Okay. Um, well, on the issue of who uh, we should be talking to, uh, I'll state my own policy. I'll talk to anybody who's interested in my ideas. Um, uh, as long as they're... <laughs> no, as, as long as they're non-hostile and they're not going to throw things at me. And, and it's even nice if they actually pay a speaker fee. Um, <laughs> but the... Um, no, I mean, I mean you're... You talk to anybody who, who is really interested in what you have to say. Um, that, that's it. And in terms of who is objectivist and who is not, and what is objectivism and what is not, well, I mean, take my own work, okay? Ayn Rand admitted that the question I work on, induction, is a, a very important philosophic question that she didn't talk about. Now, I think that what I've said about it is consistent with her epistemology and her theory of concepts. So should it be regarded as objectivism? Well, to tell you the truth, I don't think of it that way. Um, I think of it as, as my work. She did what she did. I did what I did. Um, people can decide whether the two are, are consistent. Uh, I think they are. I think it's wonderful to integrate the two as a part of your own understanding of thinking methods and epistemology. But what you call it, um, I, I, I call it my ideas on induction. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Last, last question. <clears throat> yes. Uh, each of us is a unique organism with unique experiences. So doesn't it follow that if two people agree about everything, at least one of them is not thinking for himself? Uh, likely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Diana, yes, for the thought. Yes, yeah. um, uh, that would take some interpretation. Could I just add a footnote to that? Somewhere, and I can't quote you where in verbatim, Ayn Rand said she did not own the truth. She did not own the whole concept of rationality. Everyone else who went through the thinking process and arrived at the same premises and truth owned it for themselves. It did not belong to her. She did not have a monopoly on it. I'll, I'll, so uh, I, we can try to find the source where she uh, wrote I'll, that. I'll, I'll read a quote that I think captures uh, what you just said. This is from uh, Atlas Shrugged, page 1019, if my reference here is right. It says, the vilest form of self-abasement and self-destruction is a subordination of your mind to the mind of another. The exception of his assertions as facts, his say-so as truth, his edicts as middlemen between your consciousness and your existence. I think that says it pretty well. Excellent. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I think that, that concludes our panel. I, I will, uh, Will, would you like to make me, have me just make a couple of comments here and then we'll, right. Um, what, I'll, what I would like to do is, is, uh, is make a little bit of a pitch for uh, the support that we need uh, in the in the Atlas Society, uh, we we need uh, support. We need resources, uh, financial support, uh, small gifts if that's what uh, that you can afford. Uh, big gifts are more better, and we love those. 
Um, the, the point is, if, if you believe in these ideas and you'd like to see them advanced, uh, know that, that they come at a cost and they, and they, take, they take work and, um, and money and resources. And if you don't have uh, a large pocketbook or the resources and you do have time, we, we need energy and engagement and we need you to think about how you can help us promote these ideas to more people, how you can get them engaged and how we can simply uh, advance this, uh, and, and, uh, this, this, uh, this movement. Um, the, uh, what I'll do is, is share a little bit about why I support uh, objectivism, the, uh, the movement, and, and uh, the Atlas Society. I grew up Catholic. Um, that, may, that may be enough for everyone to recognize. <laughs> uh, and I had a, a lot of guilt and a lot of confusion. I took ideas seriously. And, uh, being exposed to these ideas in college and then uh, thinking about them and applying them uh, has, has been a remarkable change for my life, me personally. Uh, the ability to uh, flourish, to, th to be proud, to achieve, to not be thinking that the, 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 the more highly I think of myself, the, the, the more I've sinned is a really big deal for a Catholic. So. <laughs> Uh, so that's been a, a tremendous thing for me. But I've also applied them in my business. I, I take these ideas and I find that they're, they're natural human ideas. This is the philosophy for, for living life and it has, it has mattered. And it matters in our organization and I think it's a big part of, of how we've been successful. I don't, I don't name objectivism in anything we do. I simply uh, use the ideas and the principles because they're, they're true and rewarding. But there's also a political side of this that, um, that matters a lot. And the, the, the fight for liberty is, is one that, uh, that we're all engaged in. And libertarians have traditionally argued on consequentialist grounds. They have made the argument that uh, liberty works better, economic freedom is better, and even morality gets better when you leave people the freedom to make their own choices. They'll make more rational decisions and their lives will be better. And I, I don't think that does it. I think the Founding Fathers had the, had the idea of the individualist and the right to my life, and I think Rand has brought a much deeper and more uh, uh, careful and thoughtful foundation. And I don't think we can win uh, the fight or even advance against the, um, the moral high ground, which is these, these are religions. Secular egalitarianism is a re religion. Global environmentalism is a religion. They're both anti-man, they're anti-life, they're built on envy. And we, we can't win this fight if we simply say this works better. We have to bring the moral argument to that. And that's why politically, both the practical and the moral uh, run together and why what we do is, is so important. So I'll close with a, with a bit of a challenge. My challenge would be to, to think about what these ideas have mean, meant to you, what they've done for your life, to think about what they could mean to your children and your grandchildren and to your neighbors and friends and the relationships that matter most to you. And then to think whether you can do something that would be helpful in this movement and help us to advance these ideas. Because we have a window. Freedom is never won. Uh, we, we won't ever <clears throat> have a case where liberty is insured for forever. But we can lose it for a generation or two or three or longer. And we have a window now where things are not going very well. And I think it's fair to say that, that we don't want to look back and say, gee, we wish we had done more. Uh, during this time. So that would be my challenge and I'll close by thanking each of you. Uh, thank uh, Will for putting on such a terrific conference and uh, Will I know you have some comments to make. <clears throat> uh, before making some concluding remarks I just want to second what Jay said. Uh, things that are practical don't happen without practical effort and we need to be building a very active, caring movement that, where people are invested in the effort to change the culture and make it possible for us to have a free and rational society. So on that note, um, it's been, uh, it's, I've been conference director off and on of this event in its various forms for going on 10 years now. And, um, it's a real joy for me personally to meet up again with all of you and see the wonderful things that our speakers do, the great ideas that the participants share. It's, and this uh, few days has been um, remarkable in that respect. What, I'm the public face of this conference. 
<coughs> and the conference goes actually smoothly, not so much uh, because I'm sitting there keeping a spreadsheet going or something like that, although I, I pitched in for sure. But it's also the conference staff who uh, you haven't been out in front of you uh, who've been really making this all happen. So I'd just like to take a moment to thank each of them uh, personally. Uh, I'd like to begin with the conference assistants who helped make each of the sessions uh, run on time and uh, run effectively. Um, and there are two of them who are, had to leave a little early this morning, uh, Eric Aserod and Carmen uh, Ramirez, but they really helped uh, and uh, helped really make it happen. Uh, here t today are Lauren Rumpler and Scott McGinley. If you all stand up, please, a moment of appreciation. <laughs> Uh, one of the visible faces of TAS throughout the conference has been Lori Rice running our bookstore. But uh, let's give a hand to Lori for her work. I think the store has looked uh, really vibrant uh, this time. I'd like to mention uh, my colleague, uh, Aaron Rainwater, who, um, when this, a few weeks ago, in a, in a meeting before the start of the uh, conference, I uh, said to Aaron, you got to understand, you're not here to have fun. You're here to make this conference work really well. <laughs> and frankly, I've been sad how much, when I've been in a cool session and having a great time in discussions, I've seen Aaron running around taking care of everything. So thank you, Aaron, please. <laughs> a hand for Aaron. <clears throat> now, in your binder, you'll see we have a list of our most generous donors. And up at the top of that list are our benefactors <coughs> and patrons. And I would like to um, add somebody to that role right now. Uh, Rhonda Lambert, where are you? Rhonda? <laughs> Ro Rhonda worked tirelessly arranging things here, working with the conference center, working with the hotel, arranging transport, arranging the common room, all these things. During the conference, when I said to Aaron Rainwater, wow, you've been doing a fantastic job, he would say to me, no, it's Rhonda, Rhonda. And so, thank you so much, Rhonda. And finally, I encourage you all to fill out your surveys. Let us know what you think of the conference. Help us make a better one next time. You can hand in paper copies up on the front desk. You can do it online. Please complete all that activity by July 7th. Thank you very much. And finally, thank you so much for coming, joining us in this celebration of objectivism and of great ideas. And take it with you out in the world and celebrate it. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Will, for an amazing job.